Hey everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and it is episode number 268 of Goulet q and I have to be honest with you, I intended to shoot this one last week, had some family things come up, needed to leave during my normal Q&A filming time, and quite honestly, I did not have room in my schedule to shoot it after that fact, so we just had to bail on you. I apologize, I never like doing that. It kills me to do that, in fact, but uh, you know, just duty called and I had to be a family man. So anyway, everything's fine. I don't want you to worry, um, but I will give you fair warning that I prepped this Q&A last week. <laughs> So some, all the questions are a week old and uh, I had to kind of update and refresh it because I was like, oh, we've, we've launched more things <laughs> since then. And, uh, you know, I need to recontextualize everything based on my life uh, now. But in this episode today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, what are the things that I would buy today if I was new starting over in the pen hobby, uh, our team's favorite like stationery and accessories and stuff like that. And then my bias in reviewing fountain pen stuff as a retailer, so among other things. But anyway, on the personal front, very much enjoying my cubing, my puzzle solving stuff. I've kind of gone off the deep end with that recent obsession. I actually got into cubing like five years ago, solving a three by three Rubik's cube, and now I'm getting into all kinds of crazy puzzles and that, and I've got a Gigaminx back there and all kinds of fun stuff, nine by nines, and I'm getting into some really crazy puzzles. Gigamorphics, if you know, if you're into puzzling, you know some of these things, but anyway, I'm having a blast, enjoying it. Uh, Rachel's being a good sport, my kids are kind of getting into it. Um, we did some fun yard sailing with our kids the other weekend, that was pretty cool, teaching them about how to find deals and buying retail versus buying secondhand and some of the pros and cons of doing both things, so good life lessons for the kiddos. Um, and then just in general, Rachel and I, we're coming up on just a really, really busy time of year for us. Uh, I'm a little more... I never really know what's going on, so <laughs> I don't give myself credit, but I'm much more like take things as it comes. So I don't get too stressed out about having things busy in the future, but Rachel's definitely a planner. She thinks ahead, likes to anticipate. So she's looking down the pike going, we're gonna have a completely insane rest of 2019. And I'm like, you know, my, my response to that is usually, you know, we're gonna figure it out, or what's the worst that could happen, or, you know, <laughs> we'll make the most of it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but that's probably because she picks up a lot of my slack. But anyway, we as a couple, as business owners, as parents, whatever, we're trying to find uh, what balance looks like for us because sometimes things just get a little crazy. So anyway, we're spending a lot of time on that. Uh, that said, there's a lot going on. I have a lot of stuff to talk to you about today. Um, one is we shot a couple videos this week. We did a fall roundup uh, introducing our new um, Edison Premier, which I realized I intended to pull, and it's right here. There you go. <laughs> I was like, where did I put it? My desk is a disaster because it's been a crazy week. Um, but anyway, here is the Premier. So we talked about this a little bit. Really nice color, um, very kind of subtle color. We've done like Bonfire before, which is a much brighter orange and black. So it's kind of along that vein. Um, but this is definitely, if I had to describe it, Bonfire would be more like a, a live vibrant fire. This is more of like the fire that's kind of dying down, um, kind of those last kind of smoldering, uh, you know, charcoals and flames and stuff like that. It's got black trim, which we haven't done a whole ton of these, and that's pretty cool. Um, may have some supply issues on the black nibs in the future, so not sure how much more we'll be able to do these, so wanted to get one last one in here when we knew we could. So those are available right now. Shot a full video on that on right now, and then, um, you know, I had another thing come up Wednesday morning this week. Uh, and uh, Drew and Adrian covered for me on the pilot night. It was very last minute, so they were great sports about covering that. Um, but we do have some pilot nights now, which is a pen that is discontinued about 10 years ago. Um, very similar to a Pilot Metropolitan, so if you like that pen, you can explore that. So we have that paired up with some ink, so you can, uh, you can go check that out. It's on the site right now. Um, we launched a Girologio Grab and Go, which I meant to grab one and go show it to you, but I don't have it, but um, you can check them out on the site. So it's uh, more than just a pen case. It's got a pen case. It's got, you know, a little hook for your keys. It's got, you know, card slots and stuff like that. So it's more of a wallet slash pen case. So it's kind of cool, interesting format. We're testing it out. Um, so we got a couple options there. Visconti came out with a new pen model. Um, this is a US exclusive at the moment, um, at least in this material and stuff like that. It's a, 
as a model, it's probably going to be offered in the future, I would imagine. Um, but for right now, you can only get this one in the US. Um, so this is called the Caesars Firenze. So it celebrates Julius Caesar's founding of Florence in 59 AD. Um, it uses their titanic celluloid, so it is actual celluloid, which is harder and harder to come by these, this, these, uh, these times. So there's only 59 of each trim. There's a rose gold and a silver trim. Um, it's got 18 karat nibs on a couple of the nib sizes, palladium on the other. Visconti's kind of in transition on that, on those nibs right now, but it's a full-size nib. It's got the uh, power filler, so the, the vacuum filling mechanism there. Um, it's got a um, backfilled enameled uh, clip, Visconti clip there with a the spring, spring bridge clip. Um, and the pen uh, model itself is pretty cool. It's faceted, and I don't know how much you'll really be able to see this, but it's faceted. It's got these two facets on the side. You can't see that great, but it's sort of. Um, and the facets are kind of, they're not straight on the side, they're at a little bit of an angle. So this is interesting, it's a different kind of shape. Um, it's, it's a little subtle, but you can notice it there. Number of limited editions, you can check them out. We got them right now on our site for $7.95. Um, what else do we have? We have a couple new Banu pens, the Briolettes in both Eden and Storm. We had the Pilot Vanishing Point Tropical Turquoise limited edition from 2019, and they're all gone. So we don't have any more. I doubt we're going to be able to get more. If I'd shot this last week, then I would have said, we've got them right now, go get them. But now they're all gone. So um, if you are interested in one of these, we don't have any more, but you should go try to find them where you can because it's a bang in color and I think it's going to be very popular and they will not last very long. So you can check that out. Um, Pelican M205 Star Ruby. Just got these in this week and it looks awesome. Um, the color's a nice like Merlot, kind of Bordeaux color. It's got some nice glitter action happening in it. I'll see if I can show it up close, but it is difficult to see on camera, but boom, there you go. So it's a demonstrator for sure. You can see the piston mechanism in there. But uh, I can't remember Pelican doing like a glitter-infused resin pen like this. Um, and it's not like this huge chunky glitter. It's very subtle, so the whole pen just kind of, just kind of glows. It kind of sparkles. You know, not necessarily everybody's vibe, but it looks great. It's got a steel nib on it, um, you know, extra fine through broad. So if you like the Pelicans, the nibs are removable. That's one thing I love about the Pelican pens is uh, nib units removable, very easy to clean out and stuff. Um, and then uh, the piston mechanism is nice, ink capacity is pretty good, 168 for this guy. Uh, and then we are going to have soon the uh, Pelican M1005 Stresemann, which is a uh, morning suit. Uh, it's a nice gray kind of pinstripe look. It looks really, really classy. And we haven't not had a lot of M1000 pens here, uh, mainly to special editions, and they haven't really done a whole ton of those. So first one that we'll have had in a while, it's coming in October. Um, we're very excited about that. Um, we're looking in the 700 range for that pen, but the nib on it is fantastic and huge. It's a big pen. Uh, we also just got wind of Platinum has a new pen that's coming out called the Prefonte. I don't think that's how you pronounce it. Prefonte? I don't know. Um, but basically, it's a slightly upscaled preppy. So it's a $10 pen. It kind of looks the general shape of a Procyon. Um, but it's got, uh, you know, some similar accoutrement to the uh, Preppy. So it's, if you want something that looks a little bit less like a disposable pen than a Preppy, but you don't quite want to pay what you would pay for a Procyon, uh, the Profonte may be a good option for you. It's got five different colors, which all look pretty nice. These, like, nice kind of demo darkish colors. Um, haven't used one. I haven't seen one. Converter won't be included with that one, but I think it's a pretty decent pen in that like nice kind of entry level range. So I'm very curious to see how it looks out. It looks like I have the same nib and feed mechanism as the Preppy, so I imagine the writing experience will be similar there. Fine and medium nib. Um, so once I have more information, I will talk about it more for sure, um, because especially to find good pens in that price range is always exciting to see. Um, and then speaking of good pens that are exciting, we are going to release next week the Twisby Eco Transparent Purple. Um, I do have mine in, and we're going to have the rest of them, um, I believe, on the website. We say on Monday, so unless something goes horribly wrong, we're planning to launch them. It's coming Monday, September 30th, so go ahead and sign up for the email notification if you have not already, but be ready for these pens. And i got to say, this looks 
awesome. Like this purple is just great. Everybody I know around the office here who's a purple fan is like squealing as soon as they see it. Um, you know, cause sometimes like, you know, some of the oranges and some of the other colors like end up being too yellow or, you know, other things like people interpret greens or blues or whatever things to be, you know, one thing in their mind and then they see it and they're like, oh, that is a little different than what I was hoping, you know, but this to me, like, at least in my own, you know, subjective view, this is exactly what I envisioned was hoping for with a transparent purple, this kind of like deep violet. Uh, very happy with this, pretty cool. I'm definitely keeping one for myself. All right, that is it for product stuff. We got more stuff that's coming, but you know, figure that's enough for one day. All right, I got six questions for you today and I'm gonna try to move through them intentionally. <laughs> Pen and writing questions. This first one is from Chimo, to, Chimo Tofu on Instagram. If you had to start your fountain pen collection from scratch, what pen would be your first purchase? So I interpreted this question to be like, knowing what I know now, if I had to start over, what would I do? Um, you know, I could hypothetically take this as if I was a new person getting into fountain pens, uh, but I'm going to just go with, you know, if I, if I, you know, didn't have any of the pens I had, but I had all the pen knowledge and experience that I do, which pens would I go for first? Um, you know, so for me, I think back to where I was 10 years ago, um, you know, there were a lot of the same pens that were around now. There's a lot of other new ones that were there. So some of the first ones that I went to 10 years ago are still solid pens, still offered, and I would still recommend them to people new getting into fountain pens. Um, so things that I got, uh, when I first started out, I had a Lamy Vista or the Safari Vista, as it was still kind of called back in those days. Um, you know, it's the exact, it's the exact same pen as a Safari. It's just transparent. So they called it the Vista. Not sure if you knew that. Um, I had to learn that off the bat. I was like, oh, the Vista, oh, the Safari, they look really similar. And then eventually I learned like, oh, it is the exact same pen. Anyway, so great pen. You can swap the nibs and all this kind of stuff. So, um, you know, a lot of people recommended Lamy at that time, still do, great brand. So that one, and the Vista I just liked, it was clear and I could use whatever ink I want. The whole concept of using a demonstrator pen was kind of new and unique. Um, so yeah, definitely I would be into that. Um, the Quaco Classic Sport is one that I uh, had. This is actually the original one that I got. There was one, you know, the first batch of commercially made pens that I ever got, um, I placed in one order and I got like five or six pens. Um, and these these two were both ones that I got in that very first. So these are 10 year old pens. Um, maybe even more than 10 years now at this point because I think that was in like July or August or something like that of 2009. So going on 10 years with these same pens. Um, the reason I liked the Coeco uh, Sport is because I read that people eyedropper converted them and I was very curious about that process. So I got it so that I could do that. So that was kind of fun back when that was kind of even a more obscure of a thing than it is today. Um, the Platinum Preppy, still a great pen, still would highly recommend. A lot of people eyedropper converted this one too um, for that increased ink capacity. So definitely, I would still consider that one too these days. Pilot Varsity, I actually didn't get this one on my radar early days, um, but it's a great pen, especially if you're just getting used to fountain pens, you don't want to clean it, highly recommend. Great writing pen too, performs really well, and it's not that expensive. Um, another pen that I bought kind of right off the bat, this is a Pelican Pelicano. And this is the old design because it's one of the originals that I had. Um, it was kind of in that same range of like a Lamy Safari or something like that, or the Quaco. It was kind of in that $20 to $25 range. Um, takes a standard international converter and uh, has a couple different nib size options. It was known as just kind of a reliable writer. So it's kind of like Pelican's answer to the Safari's call, uh, to Lamy's call there. Um, never really took off for us. We don't offer it anymore because it's just, it's not something that a lot of people ask us about. We've tried carrying it off and on and it just hasn't really been super popular for us. Um, and then another one that I really loved when I first got into it was the Pelican Script. Again, we carried it for a while off and on. Hasn't been super popular, but it's a great um, pen with an italic nib, stub nib. Um, and it's actually got a little bit of bounce to it. Stainless steel nib, it's, it's not a super expensive, $15, $20, somewhere around that range, maybe 25, I can't remember. Um, standard international converter. It is a kind of a script like calligraphy pen. So it's, you know, it doesn't really post, you know, it's kind of long. So it's more of a little more of a desk pen. It's not exactly something you kind of carry in your pocket so much. Um, but it was my first introduction into a, a stub pen 
Um, and I really fell in love with it. In fact, I ended up buying like five or six of these things inking it up in all different colors. Um, so, you know, when I first got into the whole fountain pen thing, my intention from the very beginning was to get as broad of a diversity of experience as possible because I was reading all these different things about things that people were getting into. And I was like, I want to try that. I want to experience this. I want to do that. Uh, and what I've come to learn over time about myself, reflecting now, thinking a little bit about who I am as a person, uh, that is just my nature. So I'm not one who goes like super, super, super deep in one area and learns absolutely everything there is about it. You know, obviously fountain pens is a, is a somewhat specific niche. So, you know, you could argue that maybe I'm not <laughs> as self-aware as I think I am. But no, like I'll get into fountain pens, but I'm not like getting super deep into one specific brand and I learn the entire history of that one brand and I become the subject matter expert on that just one brand, I like to have a broad range of experiences um, with different types of products and different things like that. And then I make connections and comparisons across them all over the place. So I like learn very broadly. I'll go, go pretty deep on some of it, um, but then I make connections and comparisons across a wide range of things. That's exactly what I've done in the fountain pen world. It's exactly what I've done in like woodworking, for example, like that is a passion of mine. Um, I don't get super deep into one skill as a woodworker. Like I could make dovetails, like hand cutting dovetails. You can go super deep on that, um, but I don't do that. I'll try it. I'll try this and da, 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 and I'll try, you know, all these different techniques and buy different tools. I like to have a very diverse range of experiences. That's just kind of my MO. Same thing like now I'm getting into puzzles. You know, I'll do like, you know, regular three by three Rubik's cubes. They have competitions where you can practice like one type of cube and learn literally hundreds of different algorithms to get faster and faster and faster at doing them. I'm like, no, eh, I don't really care if I can solve it in a minute or 30 seconds. Okay, is it really worth hours and hours and hours of practice for me to get there? Or I wanna get different types of puzzles and have to completely figure out all new puzzles. Like that's more my MO. So now I have like 50 different puzzles and they're all different kinds of weird shapes. And my wife's like, really, Brian? Um, <laughs> just kind of happened. Uh, but that's kind of what I like to do. So I think, you know, knowing myself, my natural propensity, maybe you're wired that way, maybe you're not, and that's okay. I think that if I was to start over, I would do the exact same thing. And I would just go for a broad range of a lot of different things. I would get a mix match, mishmash, hodgepodge of different types of things, trying to get different pens of sizes and weights and nib types and brands and all these types of things. And I would largely do exactly what I've done. So um, because I like to have experience and have pens on hand and stuff like that. Now, granted, I've experienced all these before, so would I really need to acquire all these pens again because I have it? But, you know, knowing myself and my human nature, I would probably largely repeat myself and do the same kind of thing. Now, the thing that's different is that there's other new cool stuff that's come out since I got into it 10 years ago. So I think maybe some of the pens that I would have chosen from the get uh, might have been a little bit different just because some of these, like especially like Pelicano and stuff like that, like nobody really talks about that anymore because it's just, it hasn't really been updated. It's not a really relevant pen so much for beginners as it maybe was 10 years ago. Um, now you have pens like Pilot Metropolitan has very much become a staple or the MR as it's known outside of the US um, has definitely become a staple in the kind of intro pen uh, sphere, you know? Uh, so certainly I would have, these, these didn't come out until mm, six or seven years ago. So these were not an option for me when I first started out. Uh, Jin Hao, you know, Shark Pen, Course, 51A, you know, things like that, the, you know, X450, 750. Um, certainly I would have explored those as options. Um, you know, Pelican Script, not sure if that would have been as much on my radar, but maybe the Pilot uh, Plumix, um, you know, has some different nib sizes and stuff like that. So that might be more on my radar, the Diplomat, Magnum, which funny enough has been around that long, um, but was completely, the Magnum has been around for like 30 or 40 years, like a very long time. It just wasn't really on anybody's radar until recently. And now it's like a phenomenal pen and very popular, especially starter pen. Um, so this is pretty cool. So certainly would explore that. Um, uh, let's see here. Yes, I would, I would definitely explore a variety of nib types, you know, spare nibs on like a Lamy, uh, you know, Safari or, um, you know, being able to get something like a Jin Hao and maybe get spare nibs like a, a Goulet nib or, or some, you know, other things that have spare nibs, Edison's and Monteverdi's and stuff like that. Um, certainly would be into that. The Pilot Parallel definitely is one that I would have explored, you know, especially as to 
um, get experience with uh, stub nibs and italics and stuff like that. Um, try and get that experience. You know, if I was starting over, would I go super high end? Of course, I know I love a lot of really nice pens, Visconti's and, and you know, Namiki's and things such as this. Um, yeah, I definitely would, would get into those pretty quickly, knowing what I know now. Um, but I think, you know, if I was trying to rebuild my collection, I wouldn't necessarily go for all that high end stuff because I'm not really a minimalist, as you could probably guess, especially in the pen sphere. Um, so I would largely look to acquiesce. Acquiesce? Is that the right word? I don't know if I'm using that correctly. Acquire is what I'm trying to say. Uh, a multitude of different pens uh, across a wide variety of brands. And the quickest way to do that is to start low end and then work your way back up. So if I had to start all over again, I would probably do it the exact same way um, because I like to have a lot of pens to experience and share them and talk about them with everybody. And if I was starting over and did it low end, that's exactly what I would do. So there you go. Um, if you're newer and just starting out, a lot of pens I mentioned here, I think are really great. A lot of other ones that I know, but um, yeah, there you go. All right, John Ames 76 on Instagram. Any thoughts on making replacement ebonite feeds and nib housings to swap onto pens? Um, you probably, I would imagine that you're looking at flexible nib factory, um, which is pretty darn cool. So um, custom manufacturer who's, who's making housings and ebonite feeds for specific uh, commercially made pens, Mont Blancs and, you know, Namikis and Pilots and like these types of things. Um, you know, so that's basically kind of like an aftermarket modification, right? Like if you are buying things like that um, after the fact, it's sort of like if you buy a car and you replace the wheels on it or you replace the, you know, so you buy a Ford Escort and you throw a turbo on it. Um, they're not going to warranty that anymore because you've modified it uh, and you are kind of taking that into your own hands. So for me as a authorized retailer, of said brands, if I was to offer to you a modified, especially on like the very much the heart of the pen, which is the ink flow, the nib, you know, the, that whole mechanism in there that, that provides the ink from the ink chamber to the tip. Uh, if I was to modify that, it is no longer a warranted item. It would not be an authorized sale anymore at that point. So definitely wouldn't be able to just like swap it out and replace it. But even if we were offering it and promoting it as a modification, that gets into a sticky place um, in terms of, you know, are we representing the type of product that the manufacturers would expect us to as an authorized retailer? Um, so that gets to a real sticky place. So, you know, for me, I haven't really explored that myself in offering that, especially because, you know, Flexible Nib Factory is the only one that I know that's, that's actually doing that currently. Um, and they've all got to be made kind of like one at a time. They've all got to be designed and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and then of course, if, if that design ever changes on the pen from the manufacturer, it's all got to be tweaked. It's kind of like if they come out with a new iPhone, like all the iPhone cases have to change. You know, the people that make the iPhone cases aren't necessarily getting a heads up on that, you know? So um, it's the kind of thing that like, it would be definitely be considered an aftermarket modification. So it gets into a, an interesting place and, and, and I'm open to, that kind of stuff, but it's uh, because it's such like to the heart of what the pen is, um, that does get a little tricky, the feasibility, the logistics and economics of it, you know, get interesting. You know, would you be willing to pay, I don't know, $50, you know, for an ebonite housing and feed for a given pen, not even the nib, not, you know, just, just those parts, probably not most of you. Um, so it gets into this, this place where I, you know, there might be some demand, but you're really talking like it's a custom modification pretty much at this point. So, um, you know, go check out flexible nib factory. It's pretty cool. Know that if you're swapping out parts of your pen like that, like the manufacturer's not going to warranty if somebody else's parts are in your pen. So you're taking your pen's life into your own hand. Um, you know, but I'm interested to get your feedback on it. If you think it's something cool and, uh, and all that, uh, It'd be interesting to see what you think. Okay. All right. At Batman on Twitter, what are some of the Goulet gang's favorite writing accessories? Do you find full immersion use of blotters, pounce, especially with tea writing desks, etc., into the experience very common? Or is it more of a mix of utilitarian and practical accessories? So it's interesting. Like our team is probably maybe a little different than your typical I'll call it, you know, working professional uh, 
crowd in terms of how much they might be into fountain pens. Obviously, there's a passion for them around here. Um, but it is interesting, you know, it's like if you get into other really passion driven, you know, I've, I have other e-commerce people that I've known who sell maybe, you know, puzzles or sell knives or something like that, where it's like a very much enthusiast driven thing. Fountain pens are still relatively obscure in terms of its mainstream. So when we go looking for talent, looking to hire people, there's actually not that many people that really have a lot of fountain pen experience that are in our area that, you know, are doing that. So like, it's very rare that we would get somebody that <laughs> you might be thinking to yourself, that's crazy. This is like a dream job. Um, but no, in all practicality, um, you know, we've not had people with a lot of fountain pen experience that work here. So largely they're getting exposed to fountain pens through their experience here with the products that we sell, with interacting with you all as our customers. So getting into like specialty accessories and stuff like that, that is even going a step beyond what they do here and getting into it like even more on their own. Now that might happen here and there, but I would say it's not like every single person that works here like fountain pens become their entire life and they become obsessed with them and they go to fountain pen shows on the weekends and like they might, especially some of our team, you know, gets more into that than others, but it's, it's not like a requirement that we do and, and uh, it's not something that like is just ingrained in the culture. Everybody here loves pens, we love our customers, love what we do, but at the same time, it's still a job, right? Like, and sometimes you wanna just do something different than what you're doing in your eight to five. Um, and, uh, and that's okay. So, you know, when I look around the office and I kind of asked some of the team, you know, there's like little bits and things that people will, you know, be it in an antique shop and they'll, they'll pick up a little box or they'll pick up a little thing. But, you know, I would say that in general, we don't have like this massive, like massively entrenched, like writing accessory, collection or passion throughout our team. Um, you know, there are some people who, who acquire little bits and things and we sell blotters and some of that. Pounce, I don't know anybody who uses Pounce here. Pounce is like a powder that can soak up excess ink. I don't know anyone who uses that here. In fact, I had to kind of look up what it was when you asked the question. Um, specialty writing desks, like, you know, you can find like antique writing boxes and things like that. We have the Galen writing box that's on our site now that we have not yet received that is, um, probably going to be very popular and not very in stock for a while. Uh, a lot of our team's excited about that, but in general, people aren't going like off the rails buying antique writing desks on eBay and things like that. They have awareness of it and all that, but uh, I, I would say probably our team falls much more on the utilitarian side. Now I can't speak for everybody, but um, you know, utilitarian and practical accessories is probably very true. Um, definitely some people get more into vintage pens and maybe restore some of them and stuff like that. Um, but a lot of them are doing that like at home. They're not bringing that stuff in here. So I may not be aware of how much some of them are doing it in their spare time, but they, um, they largely are doing the things that, um, that you, you know, messing around with the stuff that you see on our site. Um, and maybe not going super deep on, on other things besides that. Um, we have sealing wax, you know, that is definitely something that's cool and some people get into, some people get into like mixed media and ink washing and stuff like that. That's not really an accessory so much, maybe like brush pens and stuff, but, um, largely it's not like you're walking through our building and it looks like it's you know, the turn of the 19th century or something like that. Um, Cause it's just, you know, we're still like a pretty modern conventional office. Um, so yeah, I think uh, just our, our product mix, you know, what our team members are getting into personally is probably mostly a reflection of what you all have asked for and, and kind of ultimately purchased. Um, and that's ever shaping, but uh, you know, you can you can kind of see like the accessories. It's not like our whole site is accessories. We have some stuff, but it, it doesn't make up a huge, huge portion of what we do. Um, so our team is not like, you know, hard pressed uh, getting into that stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of curious if you all have had experiences yourselves about these things, especially if we were more into vintage things, that would probably be more of a thing. But because we're into modern, um, there's not as many modern manufacturers of things like blotters and stuff like that. So it's, it, that's probably a huge influence on how much we get into to all these things. All right. Mark H on Facebook asked if the tipping on every nib is the same and that's where the rubber meets the road. Why are nibs so different in their feedback? Um, great question. You know, been asked this question in various forms many times. 
Um, it's kind of like saying, you know, it's, it's a bit of a generalization to say that the tipping is the same. And it's kind of true, but it's, it's about like saying, you know, well, every car has rubber tires, and if the rubber is the same, isn't it pretty much the same to drive every car? It's like, well, there's a bit more to it than just the part that's touching the road. Yes, that does play a factor in how the car handles and feels and, and looks maybe and, and stuff like that, but there's a lot more going on. And that's, to, cars are obviously more complicated than pens, um, but that's kind of same principle is that, uh, you know, there's a little more to it just than that. Um, so there is actually a difference between the tipping on different pens, um, talking to different nibmeisters and stuff like that. Some people, you know, the tipping is an alloy. So you can use different alloys that have different hardness and, and things like that. Um, also, obviously, the, the size of the tipping, the shape of it, how smoothly it's ground, um, all play into how a pen physically feels when you're writing with it on, on the page. Um, you know, the nib design, the flow, you know, the flow of the ink through the slit and through the feed and all that comes into play. Um, if there's very wet flow, it can feel a little more lubricated and make it write a little smoother. So there's other things coming to play. The, ink, the paper itself obviously is a huge factor. Um, but, uh, you know, the nib, yes, it's true that that is the part that actually touches the page. Um, and, you know, with the right kind of work on it, with the right smoothness and stuff like that, you can generally make the feedback on a nib feel pretty similar um, but across most pens, you know, because it is still like a hard metal alloy. Um, generally, a pretty good amount of rhodium in there, not a ton of iridium, even though a lot of them say iridium point Germany on some of the unbranded kind of pens that are out there. Um, but really, there's not that much iridium in the world these days. Iridium is not even like a material that comes from Earth. It basically comes from asteroids. They mine like three tons of it a year, which is not that much in the world. Um, much more likely to be some blend of platinum or rhodium or some other hard precious metal. There's a lot of alternatives now that have been discovered um, and been able to be handled besides iridium. Um, but anyway, it was very classically used as iridium. That's why it comes up, but it, I digress. Um, so yes, you can get um, you know, other aspects of the pen can, can make a big difference in how a pen feels. You know, particularly the, the nib material, you know, think of that as like a shock absorber on the car. So if you have a nib that's, that's very soft and kind of flexible, made of gold or palladium or something like that, or it's just ground thinner, um, you, can, you can get more bend or more softness, springiness to your nib that can, even if the tipping is exactly the same, you get a softer pen, like think about like a Platinum and Pilot have some nibs that are like their regular version and some that are their soft version. That's what happens is they, they soften it, you know, basically by, by um, kind of either taking away some of the material or taking away some of the material on the sides of the wings just to, to make it so it's a little more bendy. Um, so that can greatly change how it feels because it will absorb a lot of the variation in your writing pressure and make it feel a lot smoother, even though the tipping's exactly the same. So a lot of it has to do with adjustments to the nib, these nib, nib materials, things like that. Um, but of course, you know, when you're writing with a pen, it's not even just, just the feedback, but there can be other things like, you know, the, the size, the material of it, the design of the nib, the flexibility of it, the flow, all that can vary um, with the nibs based on their design. Um, so yeah, those are all just, you know, little bits and pieces. And the tough thing about it, getting into this hobby, and really when you get deep into any hobby like that is um, it's not always clear which pens are exactly which way because it's not like there's a scientific numerical rating for every one of these aspects of every single nib that's standardized across the whole industry. A lot of it is just, you know, there's so many technical things that you could get into even with something as specific as a nib on a fountain pen that uh, it would be almost impossible. You'd be looking at like an MSDS sheet that's like 18 pages long with all these different technical specs on every single pen. And yes, theoretically, you can scientifically compare them one to another, but how do you actually quantify how it's gonna feel in your hand or what it's gonna mean to you? Some of that is you just gotta get in your hand to experience it. Some of it's you gotta watch reviewers who have experience that talk about it in a way that's you know easier to understand. Um, and then some of this just comes with experience and preferences and learning what you like. So it's all part of the, it's all part of the fountain pen journey is learning how all this stuff works. Um, but that at least explains maybe a little bit deeper why it can vary um, even with something that's as relatively consistent as the tipping of the nib.
All right, I got a paper question this week from Roy H. on Facebook. Sort of business question, have you or the team considered expanding into stationary items, particularly the more specialty end, such as those found in Japan? Um, so it's a great question, you know, kind of falls into the same category as the accessories question that I just took a couple questions ago. So I don't want to repeat myself too much there, but um, kind of a similar theme going on there. A lot of it starts with, you know, the offerings that we have here largely boils down to what are you all asking for? What's available out there? What's cool? You know, is there a supply and demand that we can match up together? Because as a retailer, that's like one of the things that we do best. Customer service, obviously. Distribution in the way of moving products from one place to another. But a lot of it is we try to understand you as the pen community, what products you want, what do you like, what do you think is a good value, these types of things. We source all this, we take all this and mash it all together and we try to find these products that will meet your needs. That is a complete oversimplification of the process, but largely that's what it is. If you want something, we try to find it and if it works out for everybody, we've won. But, um, you know, there's, there's, there's so many just things, there's so many products in the world, so many things that people make, so many things that people want. Um, that is just a very hard thing to do well sometimes. Um, so, you know, particularly if you're looking at, you know, some of these specialty items that come out of places like Japan, and maybe it's not specifically Japan, maybe it's other places, maybe it's not just paper, but maybe it's other products. Um, you know, how do we get these like really specialty things and offer them up to you all? Well. A lot of that starts out with demand. It's really a challenge for us being in the U.S. to find some of these specialty items from places like Japan because for one, a lot of these specialty items don't really have, um, you know, a lot of information in English. <laughs> we don't have people here that speak Japanese. Um, so, and we're clear on the other side of the U.S. Like if we were on the West Coast, that might be a little easier because it's 3,000 miles closer to Japan, but we are like clear on the other side of the world. Um, so that can be difficult. I mean, theoretically, we can like grab copy off a website and put it in Google Translate and sort of piece it together, but even that doesn't work so great sometimes. And just trying to communicate back and forth can be challenging. So trying to understand the nuances of something as technical as writing accessories like paper especially if it's things that aren't widely available and we're trying to understand what it is and the nuances and what makes it different. There's a huge language barrier there and just an uncomprehension understanding barrier on our part of trying to source that out. Um, so that is a huge challenge. The distribution, the availability of the supply is a huge challenge. Um, you know, if there is not kind of an intermediate, even for us as a retailer, if there's not an intermediary there who understands you know, the Japanese culture and supply and, and importing and all that stuff, it can be very difficult for us to play that role. Um, so we, we might need somebody who takes it from, you know, these specialty manufacturers and then offers them up to retailers and can explain all the technical things and has available stock on a pretty regular basis and, and that kind of stuff and can do like the currency conversions and the import taxes and deal with the shipping carriers and, you know, can keep up to date on the weather patterns of what's going on. So if there's a typhoon, they know the shipment's going to be delayed and all these types of things. It gets very, very complicated when you get into international importing, exporting type stuff. It's not something that typically you would have a single retailer focusing on unless you were selling in a pretty large scale or a large volume. So you got to be a pretty big size. We're still relatively small in the grand scheme of things. So that can be a real challenge is how do we actually source out those products and then get a continuous supply of them. So that that is very prohibitive for us. Um, but really a lot of it boils down to, you know, knowing what you want. Um, paper especially is a challenge because it's very heavy, especially to ship all the way from Japan. We're shipping it all the way across the world. It's heavy. So in order for it really to be economical, it's got to be shipped by boat, which is not so easy to get to here because there's like this dang continent in the way in between the two of us. Again, if you're in California or something on the West Coast, it's a little, little more straightforward, but still really far. So we're either looking at air freighting it, which is incredibly expensive, or we got to ship it by boat and it takes like two months, which is kind of crazy. And it's still pretty expensive. So it gets to be a big challenge because there's even more to coordinate, lots of factor in in terms of timing and all this kind of stuff. The preferences that people have for specialty items can change on a whim. So when we're trying to get a regular supply of something that is very niche 
very kind of uncommon, maybe not known about. <coughs> By the time we would get it, import it, cipher through all of the technical information and then promote it, we may have missed the boat anyway. Maybe literally, but we may have missed the boat on whatever that was made that thing desirable and somebody else may have come out with something or maybe the, the whims and fancy of that novelty may have passed. So it is a real challenge and we just have not dove in real deep on that. Partly because it's just, there's other things that, you know, are more of a need that we can fill. And until we've completely filled that need, we're not going like more and more um, novelty, I'll call it. Um, uh, or, you know, specialty, I guess. Um, I think that, you know, if you have a retailer who's really passionate about that or maybe has some kind of connection that makes that barrier a little lower, whether it's a geographic thing, whether it's a cultural thing, a language thing, you know, something like that, um, certainly it could make more sense there. You know, I think that, uh, um, you know, it's not like it doesn't make sense and it's not a values alignment or anything. It's a lot of it's just down to practicality, the amount of time and money and effort it would take us to acquire Certain products like that would make it very cost prohibitive. By the time we would be able to break even, we'd have to mark it up so much that you wouldn't want to buy it. So it's just not practical. Or like three people would want to buy it, but we'd have to buy 500, and then we'd just be sitting there and uh, we wouldn't be able to operate that way. So we got to take a lot of this into account. So we haven't we haven't explored that real heavily. I mean, Tomoe River was one, um, really was a specialty paper several years ago. And it's funny because you know, just kind of as we've talked to other people like in the industry, um, I literally don't even know where it's made or how or anything like that because again, it's it's all kind of trade secrets and a bit mysterious. But like Tomoe River is one one specialty paper basically that apparently has been made in Japan for a very long time, and they like don't really understand why it's such a big deal in the U.S. Like they like they just really don't get it, you know, because they've got it going over there. It's been a big deal, but like it just kind of got on the radar of people in like the fountain pen world in the last three to five years. And now it's like everybody uses it for all their sheening and shimmers and all this kind of stuff, but they don't really use those inks over there so much. So it's just interesting. There's like differences that like they don't understand our market. We don't understand that and how they make it. So there's just so much to learn um, that makes it very specialty. So um, for those who are really passionate about it and they want to pursue it and learn more about that, you know, it's great. Um, but, you know, for, for most retailers, it's like you gotta, you got to spend a lot of extra effort going and exploring that. And it just, you know, hasn't been the thing that's driven us on this from the beginning. You know, it kind of started out being, you know, the pens. I was making pens, and so that's how we kind of got into it. Yes, we did the ink and paper uh, at the beginning, but again, it was, it was much more European paper than it was um, Japanese paper. Um, that kind of got on our radar first. Um, and that's just kind of what we're more, more familiar with. And over time, it's been um, more what uh, we've been able to, to really meet the need on. So there you go. I'm going to close out this week with a business question. This is from Muditsud on Twitter. Muditsud on Twitter? Forgive me if I mispronounce. I definitely did because I said it two different ways. Anyway, how does Brian manage to be a retailer and still able to comment on and compare products through his videos? Shouldn't a retailer be neutral in order to establish good relations with brands and distributors for longevity of business? Um, so part of the reason I took this question, I, I, like, this, I like this topic um, for one, because I've been doing reviews and videos and stuff for almost 10 years now. Um, and I've seen a lot of other people, I've talked with a lot of bloggers and stuff, and this is something that everybody gets asked about, deals with, no matter whether they're a retailer or a manufacturer, just an enthusiast, whatever. This whole idea of like bias and neutrality and fairness and all this kind of stuff comes up a lot. And I have kind of an interesting view on it that I'm always happy to share. But I really like the phrasing of your question because you're approaching it more from me as a retailer, not even necessarily trying to present like non-bias to you as a reviewer, but you're thinking non-bias to my manufacturers so that I don't piss them off <laughs> and then jeopardize my relationship as a retailer to you. So I think it's a really interesting place. I had probably a unique view on that that I would really like to share. So I wanted to end with that this week because I thought it would be kind of interesting for you all. I usually try to take most of my business heavy questions and put them towards the end of Q&A because I think those of you that are really interested that deep in that stuff, you're willing to stick around towards the end of the video. Whereas if you're purely just like, nah, just tell me about the pens, I don't really care about your business stuff. Well, then you can just kind of tune out, shut it off, that's fine, uh, I get that. But anyway, we're going deep towards the end here. So, um, so I like talking about this question. You know, personally, as a reviewer, okay, 
putting myself out there. You honor me with your attention. That is a relationship here. Um, as a reviewer, I think, you know, um, people will perhaps spend their hard earned money, you know, hopefully at my store, <laughs> um, but maybe not. And that's fine. Uh, they'll do that based on what I say. You know, literally there's a marketing buzz term right now that's called an influencer. You see it all over Instagram and all this kind of stuff. It's basically someone that has a following and they have an influence over what other people do or say or buy. Um, and that is an influencer, right? It could be very small, a micro influencer. It might be somebody that has three to six friends who they're kind of like the trendsetter in their little group of friends. And if they all start doing Rubik's cubes or using fountain pens or using Contigo coffee mugs, their friends might do it too, three to five of them. And they are a micro influencer because they are having an influence over what other people are buying or doing or showing interest in, right? So, um, you know, obviously we have a pretty decent following here at Gilly Pens now after 10 years. Um, so I take that responsibility as a person doing reviews that there is perhaps more influence in what I say than somebody who doesn't do this kind of thing, right? Um, and I think anyone, whether retailer or not, is gonna feel the weight of this type of influence, right? And I hear that from other pen people who are doing reviews and stuff like that, just as they grow, people hang on their every words, they critique, they ask all these deeper questions, they ask about things like bias and neutrality and all this kind of stuff, and they're like, I literally just turned on a camera and talked about my pens, like, I didn't have any like ulterior motives here. I just love pens and wanted to talk about them. And now all of a sudden I'm getting critiqued. And so there's a responsibility that comes with being a reviewer in this types of stuff. This is even just apart from retailing, right? So I'm just trying to lay some groundwork here. Um, so definitely anybody with a sizable viewership in any industry, um, you know, on any social platform is going to feel that weight, right? Um, you know, for me personally, I think if you don't want to, listen to this entire question because I'm already going on a bit. Um, the main theme of my answer can be understood by uh, underscoring kind of this notion of, you know, whether it's power, influence, money, fame, authority, whatever you want to kind of lump in there, you know, whatever kind of ego building thing. Um, none of those things in and of themselves um, kind of change who you are. I think it just reveals who you are. You know, so I think if you are kind of an undertone of maybe being a little bit selfish or a little bit vain, or um, you tend to take advantage of other people, you're gonna do that a little bit with a little bit of power or money or influence. And you're gonna do that a lot if you have a lot of power or money or influence. You know, I think that, uh, you know, there's a, the phrase like power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Certainly the temptation is there. Um, to have that happen. But I think in general, um, you know, it's just going to kind of magnify your actions and the temptations will be greater. If you're tempted on a small level, you're going to be even more tempted on a bigger level, right? And we're all human and we all fail. No one's perfect, myself included. Um, but I really like the Zig Ziglar quote. And this, this comes, you know, to the heart of me as a retailer, as a reviewer. He's got a, he's got a really good quote that I love that says, you can have anything in life you want if you will just help enough other people get what they want. So it's this whole idea of like putting others before yourself, really helping others first rather than thinking, what can I get out of this? This is a really important concept for me as a retailer to be thinking about when I'm shooting a video. And believe me, I'm really freaking busy. Like for me to make the time to shoot these videos, which I love doing, I really have to fit it into my day and sometimes it can be difficult to do that. As a perfect example, last week, literally my schedule got disrupted and I could not move other things to get Q&A in there, it just wouldn't happen. So for me to schedule this time, um, it could be a temptation for me to say, well, if I'm gonna make time to shoot this video, I have to sell X number of products, I have to what I would get, whatever feedback stroke, my ego, whatever, because it's just coming at too high of a cost now. You know, I certainly could take that approach, but the really the thought that I've had ever since the beginning of doing this whole thing is, I mean, I've spent, I don't know how many thousands of hours shooting videos, preparing things, learning the products, all this type of stuff, all with the ideology behind 
kind of what Zig Ziglar quantifies here. And I didn't discover this quote until like five years ago. So I had this notion before I even had it so succinctly said like this. But my whole notion was that if I help enough of you in the fountain pen community get what you want, be it information, products, motivation, entertainment, whatever it is, then you will help me by shopping here, you know, giving me good feedback, you know, friendship, camaraderie, whatever it might be, the things that fill me up um, and allow me to keep doing this. So my approach has always been if I shoot enough videos, get enough content out there, provide enough for you, then that overflow is gonna be more than enough to come back and fill me up. And that's what it's been for 10 years to where I'm still going strong, still love doing it. Um, so that's kind of my whole thing. You know, for me, getting back to the original question, talking about like bias and things like that, um, it is really interesting because I don't really think of reviews in such a way of, I have to remove bias and I have to have zero opinion and be very factual and present it in a way that makes me a robot that is not possible. Like I'm a human, I have a perspective, I have an understanding based on my skills, experience, preferences, you know, all these types of things, time in invested. Um, this is not a like double blind, you know, clinical trial of some kind that is going to affect someone's like, you know, whether they live and die, you know, so I don't need to have all those things in place. I just gotta be honest with you and authentic and disclose where I'm at. You know, I'm very forthright, I'm a retailer, I'm selling these products. You can watch this review if you want, that's fine. I will always be honest with you. You engage in the comments, we'll all engage or my team will engage with you back. Like that's the relationship we have here. Um, but yes, I'm a retailer and I sell these products and you know, my hope is to build trust and candor and, and, and all that with you so that you trust me. But. You know, I can't force that to happen and I'm not trying to make it in such a way that you don't have to trust me or like me as a person. Um, I'm just presenting facts and you can make your own opinions. Like you have your own opinions, but I as a reviewer and really everyone out there in the pen world, especially in a, a hobby like this where it's so passion driven, you're never gonna find anyone without bias. Like you will not find someone without bias because fountain pens are such a personal thing like no one is unbiased, period. Never met an unbiased fountain pen person. We all have our own preferences. We all have likes and dislikes. I have met people who are the ones manufacturing these dang products that disagree the complete opposite viewpoint of other people who are equally skilled and experienced and just believe with their whole heart in the opposite thing that other people do because it's subjective sometimes, right? So. I think trying to present an unbiased view is a waste of time and it's not that productive. I think it's better to be, do you trust, do you feel that the person presenting it is honest and are they sharing their viewpoint based on what they know? You develop a relationship with them as a reviewer and then you input in your own mind whether you agree or disagree with what it is they're saying based on how you know that you may be different or alike with their point of view, right? So that's kind of where I'm at. I'm going way longer than I intended on this question. I have a lot of bullet points and I'm through like five of them and I have like 20. Okay, I'm gonna try to move it along a little bit here. So again, it's not about trying to eliminate bias. I think it's um, that it's just trying to understand the bias that somebody's going to definitely have in the situation. For me, I make money when I sell these products. You should take everything I say with a grain of salt knowing that that bias could be there. I do my best to try not to just tell you about something because I wanna sell it. But there's a reason why I talk about the pens that I sell and I don't just leave them aside and talk about things that I don't sell. Part of that's there's a financial incentive like I and my whole team build our lives and our business based on the products that we're carrying. We believe in them, that's why we choose to carry them. And we want to share what we know about them, which we know about the products we sell way more than the ones we don't, because that's kind of our job. Like as a retailer, that's it's our job to know about the things that we sell. So that's the information I have. That's a perspective I have is based first off the things I have. And I try to gain experience with other types of things so I get perspective, but I do not know all the ins and outs of the details of a Mont Blanc or a Sailor because I don't have all the background information, I don't have the relationships with the distributors, I don't have the, all that technical information. I have experience with some of them, just kind of at the, at the surface level. 
but I don't know them as well as I know some of the other brands because I don't have relationship with those other companies. So as a retailer, you know, it's funny because I originally wanted to try to eliminate bias. We actually set up this YouTube channel and our blog as the Ink Nouveau instead of the Goulet Pens uh, or Goulet Pens blog or Goulet Pens YouTube or whatever um, to the point where if you actually look at the URL, it's still the Ink Nouveau because I can't change it. YouTube <laughs> won't let me change it. Um, go figure. Uh, and so here we are. Uh, I wanted to try to keep it separate, um, but I actually got pushback on that because people were um, when I was reviewing like things that I didn't sell, people were like, why are you telling me about this? And I, or they would ask me questions. And I'd be like, I, I don't know where you can buy it. I haven't really, and they're like, why are you reviewing this? Like, this was like first few months of Google events. Um, they were like, why are you reviewing this stuff? Why aren't you telling me about the things that are on your site? That's what I want to know about. And I was like, okay, that actually does make perfect sense. So I kind of got away from like full on in depth reviews of things that I don't know anything about. Um, to continue, um, I think that uh, there's several relationships at play with all video uh, reviews like you see here. So maybe you haven't thought about this as much before. Eh, I kind of went through and, and thought of like maybe several different things that could influence, you know, maybe the bias that, that has to be considered. Um, and, and, you know, for me as a retailer, the, the amount that it is impacted by some is going to be greater than others. But anyone doing video reviews is going to have to factor in these five things that I did. Man, I'm really going on on this question. Yeah, really, I always get paranoid that my audio is not on. Okay, we're good. <laughs> um, you're getting like the super deep, super deep thoughts of Brian here if you're going this deep into this last question. So five relationships at play with video reviews, right? One is the reviewer, right? So there's time, money, effort on their part. Um, there has to be some form of payoff. Otherwise, you would have literally have to be an insane person to spend this much time doing something. So whether it is payment, you know, you're getting paid or free product or something like that. Um, you're, there's prestige, maybe there's some kind of fame or notoriety or respect or viewer count or something like that that, that you, makes you feel good. Um, could just be good vibes. You just you are personally gratified by putting your information out there into the world. And it might be friendships and relationships that you build by being an influencer in the community, et cetera. There could be a number of different things, but there's something about you know the bias that you might have as a reviewer that could influence what it is that you choose to review. Otherwise, people will just like review three things and then stop doing it and do something completely different because we're all busy and we have a lot to do. But to consistently do something and build an audience like this, there's got to be something in for it for the reviewer. Um, another one is the sponsor, I'm calling. Um, this could be the reviewer. If they're buying their own stuff, they're basically self-sponsoring. We end up in that position a lot because basically, like I'm not, I'm not really providing free product from our manufacturers to do reviews. Um, you know, in that way, I'm, I'm actually not that biased. I actually have kind of equal footing with all of our manufacturers because I'm just grabbing products off the, se off the shelf. You know, I'm writing it off myself and taking the hit on that cost-wise. Um, and then then I'm doing a review on it. So in that way, it actually is kind of a level playing field for me. I'm not like being sent things from other companies with like pressure to, to review them and stuff like that. So, you know, in my case, I am my own sponsor, but um, a reviewer could be buying their own stuff. They could be getting supplied from a manufacturer, from a retailer. You know, we'll send stuff to bloggers. Again, when we send stuff to another blogger to do a video or do some kind of review, we always try to preface it with like, please be honest, just, if you hate it, you know, say you hate it, but try to do a, a, a fair review, you know, of what it is, you know, or if you get it and you're just not motivated to do a thing, you know, just don't, like that's fine too. So there is an, an interesting relationship there with influencers between their sponsor and whatever form that may look like. Another one is the manufacturer. So the manufacturer could be a sponsor. They could also be the reviewer, um, but most often they are kind of a step removed. So a lot of times you have a manufacturer who provides things, distributes them to retailers. The retailer might provide something to, at least in the pen world, might provide something to a reviewer or they review it themselves. Um, but the relationship of the manufacturer is they're kind of a step removed, um, but ultimately they own their brand. So they have, um, you know, a vested interest in how their brand is being presented and talked about and represented. They don't have strict control over that in the in the form of providing something to a reviewer as much as if they were doing their own advertisement and had all the direct messaging. Um, so there's a trust thing there. Um, but there is that manufacturer relationship of whoever's actually making the thing that's being reviewed. 
Another one is the audience, that's you all, the ones watching the videos, right? So you're, you're essentially voting on what you like with the attention that you're giving and with where you're spending your money, right? So if, if I, as a reviewer, am reviewing a product and you absolutely hate the way that I go about talking about it and you're like, forget this, you either thumb it down, give terrible comments, or you stop watching it altogether, then you're voting with your attention, right? Or if everybody loves it, no one buys any of it, and the company goes under because it's a terrible product, even though I might be very entertaining, <laughs> um, then you voted with your dollars, right? So that's how the relationship generally tends to work between reviewers, manufacturers, and the audience, right? Um, and the last one I have is the platform, or call it the, 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 the media distribution. So uh, in this case, it would be YouTube, right? Like YouTube, <laughs> they're, they're paying money to, to, to stream all this bandwidth and to build their platform, they're developers, they have all this kind of stuff. So YouTube is a factor as well in this relationship, right? Um, so whatever the distribution channel is, whether it's Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, whatever it might be, there's definitely some kind of relationship there of the platform. Largely, it comes in the way of advertising, right? At the end of the day. Um, and advertising may not have anything to do with the reviewer or the manufacturer. Uh, it might be ads for all different kinds of things altogether. Um, so all these relationships come into play. You know, there's different goals, biases, demands, and everything based on everybody involved here. Um, and that all kind of comes into play. So for those who do a lot of reviews and you're doing it over a consistent period of time, you get a pretty big audience, you are spending a lot of time enough to the point where you need to have some form of compensation for it, it gets somewhat complicated. Um, so for me personally, as a retailer, there's actually several parts of these that, that are pretty easy and get kind of cut out. Like I'm the reviewer, I'm also basically the sponsor. In some cases, I'm my own manufacturer as well for like, like Goulet products and things like that. Um, you know, the audience were direct with you and the platform as yeah, YouTube. So, um, you know, trying to streamline as much of that as possible, you, you think can get pretty simple and, and that helps to, you know, eliminate as much of the bias as possible. Um, but every reviewer has to factor all these things into play. Um, and for anyone who's doing it for a long time, they get good at navigating um, all these different things. So I personally think that I have a huge benefit as a retailer and reviewer because I have direct contacts kind of up the distribution chain, direct with manufacturers. So I can verify and get detailed answers on things. Um, and I don't have to make as many assumptions as somebody who's not like in the industry, right? So I can Google things, I can, I can research and I can have my own experience and everything. But when it boils down to it, if a new product is coming out and I'm not sure if they've used this celluloid before, I can reach out to the manufacturer and say, hey, this celluloid, what's the deal with this celluloid? And I can get an answer direct from them. Well, that increases my credibility quite a bit as a reviewer because I know I'm giving you right information. That to me is the biggest advantage that I have, um, bias or whatever aside, that's the biggest advantage I have as a retailer in being a reviewer is I can verify my information. Now, sometimes I'm wrong, Sometimes I make assumptions, sometimes I'm given wrong information. It's not a perfect process, but more often than not, I can be very confident in what I'm talking about because I'm an authorized retailer and I know I have it straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Um, you know, where I walk the line between you, the community, and uh, the manufacturer or distributor or whoever is in my distribution chain, um, there's a great deal of trust that has to happen both ways, right? So I'm kind of an intermediary between the two. Um, you have to trust me that I'm being honest and genuine and sharing this information um, with the best of intentions to be, to be accurate and to provide you with the information you make the choice for yourself and not just try and hard sell you be like, this is the greatest pen ever. Wait a minute, didn't you say the last pen was the greatest pen ever? How can you have two greatest pens ever? It doesn't make sense, Brian. I don't say it's greatest pen ever unless I truly believe that. But I usually try to <laughs> not make like, this is the ultimate pen. You know, I'd be like, this is a pen that I really think you're gonna love if you're new into the hobby and you also like this and this and this pen. You know, that is, that is a more accurate thing. I'm not trying to hard sell, I'm just trying to give the best perspective with my experience. Um, so the manufacturers, on the other hand, also have to trust that I'm gonna be honest and at the same time respectful. I might have an opinion that's different of theirs, 
you know, I'll be completely honest, I'm not going to call anybody out specifically, but I will say there are sometimes pens that come out or a name that comes out for a pen or a tagline or something like that that I just do not agree with. Um, not from like a values fundamental standpoint, but just from like a, an approach or like the way it sounds or the, you know, the design of a pen or something. I'm like, oh, I do not find that appealing whatsoever. But and the honest, th the honest truth is in all my experience in the pen world, I have been shocked at what, how different my opinion can be than someone else's. You know, that's why I'm so kind of open when I do reviews. I'm like, hey, here's this pen. You know, I really like the purple. Some of you might like it, some of you might not, you know, but I'm, I'm completely surprised sometimes. You know, honest truth, this Cesar Forense, this celluloid is not like my personal favorite celluloid, but I totally get the appeal and I think it's interesting and I love celluloid. Not my personal favorite blend of colors. I would love it if this blue was not as solid and was a little deeper and had more swirl. Not everybody loves deep swirly things. So um, I am, I try to be unbiased in the way I present things and not trying to say this is good or this is bad. I can say this compares to this and that and that. And so I think it's maybe not as good of a value or maybe this is going to be more popular, but I try not to make as definitive like this is such. Um, so the manufacturers have to trust, going back to my original bullet point, um, you know, I'm doing le legit research and thorough testing before I say anything, especially if it's anything negative publicly on one of their products, um, just so that I don't like come out of the blue and I'm bashing something because that tends to carry more weight as an authorized retailer. If I say that something isn't good and shouldn't be made or whatever, you know, somebody who is not a retailer can be much more extreme in their in their presentation, I guess, uh, in their viewpoints, uh, because they don't really have as much dog in the fight. And, you know, <laughs> I've had this happen before. Again, not to name any names. I've seen other people reviewing certain things, not having completely verified information and making some assumptions. And the manufacturer, you know, because I have contact with them, they're like, what the heck? They're like, why is everybody saying such and such and such? And I'm like, oh, there was a reviewer that said this. And they're like, that's completely wrong. That's not true at all. So as an authorized retailer, if I ever get into a space where it feels kind of sticky like that, I will always try to verify with them what's going on. And most of the time, the assumption is maybe not right. So I can clear things up that way. Um, a lot of it boils down to trust is our currency, right? At Goulet Pens, that is a core value of ours. There's trust on the side of the manufacturer. There's trust on the side of you as the customer, as the audience. Um, you know, and that goes all the way through our business and the distribution chain internally, externally with you, everything, all relationships, it all boils down to trust. And that's what we try to do. So that said, to summarize it all, it seems really complicated. I've clearly gone on for like 30 minutes on this question, um, but it's really quite simple. Build trust and operate from a place of strong character that's going to guide you well in a zillion little decisions along the way. Um, and that's really what I try to do. My heart's always in the right place. I try to be cognizant of all the different things that are at play, um, all the different relationships. But at the end of the day, I really just try to have good character and be honest about what it is I'm talking about. And that will help to guide the right things to kind of just come out in the process. Uh, and that's kind of what I think. So there you go, the rambling thoughts of Brian Goulet right at the end of Q&A. My question of the week for you this week is what YouTube or maybe even a non-video reviewers uh, do you respect the most for how they navigate their bias? Very curious what your thoughts are there. Thank you so much for watching this very long Q&A today. Um, I'm not going to be doing a Q&A next week because I will not be in the office during my normal shooting time. So I apologize for kind of stutter stepping Q&A. But again, this is a really crazy time of year for me. Um, I'm not gonna have to probably dip out on too many more Q&As, I don't think, until we get like deep into the holidays, Thanksgiving-ish time. Um, but I, anyway, I will be taking next week off. So hope this one satisfies you for two weeks. Um, you can check out a lot of the products that I talked about here today on GoulayPens.com because I am a retailer, full disclosure, in case you didn't figure that out, that out by, by this point already. I hope you have a great weekend and a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you so much for watching and